the Asus Sabertooth X99, taking a bite out of the premium X99 motherboard market. This is the next iteration of the venerable Sabertooth line from Asus. This is, of course, the X99 version designed to support socket 2011-3 CPUs, such as the Intel 5960X. It's got quad channel memory support, supporting up to 64 gigabytes of DDR4. That's with a clock speed of up to 3300 megahertz. For those of you not familiar, this line of motherboard uh, uses a lot of components branded tough. That is to say that it uses, you know, chokes, coils, etc., that are designed for, you know, mil spec, they say, but it's designed for durability and longevity. My opinion of this line is that they're going for workstation grade reliability, but with enthusiast features for overclocking and durability and longevity. Once again, there is so much stuff with this motherboard, I could probably drone on for an hour about it. The, the thing that separates this motherboard from other motherboards is that it's not just a motherboard, it's all the other stuff that's bundled with it. It's all the sort of thought and care put into other componentry other than the motherboard itself. So we're talking about the software bundle, we're talking about things like the dust filter, we're talking about the fan management controller, all this stuff that we'll get into, but it's a lot above and beyond just X99 socket 2011-3 motherboard with a couple of PCI Express slots. The first thing is that these boards come with a card certifying that the board has been tested before it left the factory, and there's a little list of tests that have been performed. So if you don't like getting DOA hardware, this will minimize your chances of getting a DOA motherboard. In fact, if you actually get a Sabertooth D motherboard DOA, I wanna hear from you in the forums because that would be really surprising. I wanna sort of know the circumstances of, of how that happened, but factory testing basically helps minimize the DOA and the types of tests that are done are, are shown on this card here, which is neat. The color palette of this board certainly feels military. Uh, the plastic front cover and metal back plates serve important functional uh, purposes as well. The front thermal armor provides a duct through which air can flow, and Asus provides a small fan that can be mounted above the VRMs at the back of the board for increased directed airflow. Uh, this is especially helpful for all-in-one water coolers that may not be producing much airflow around the CPU socket the way that a traditional tower cooler or you know just a normal forced air cooler would do. Uh, this mini fan also supports an option where it'll spin backwards to help dislodge dust and, and help you if you're trying to blow the system out and dust it. Uh, the back of the motherboard is fastened to this heavy metal plate, Asus calls that the tough fortifier. This is thermally connected to the motherboard and can act as a heat sink. The material provided with the motherboard says that this armor can lower the temperature of the motherboard itself by up to six degrees, which will help increase longevity and reliability. Also included in the box are dust plugs for pretty much everything. There are dust plugs for the internal connectors, the expansion slots, the IO ports, you name it. The idea is that you put these dust plugs on your unused connectors and the unused connectors are never going to collect dust. When you need to use them, you just pull the little rubber stoppers out and then you can use them and there's no dust. Also in the box are three external temperature sensors. Asus has gone all out on the thermal monitoring fan situation with this motherboard. Their marketing materials call this the tough ice, but what that actually is, uh, is a hardware IC or hardware fan controller uh, that provides five extra individually controllable DC or PWM fan headers, and there are a total of 12 thermal sensors. Now, 12 thermal sensors is a lot. Nine of those are soldered on the motherboard, and then there are three extras that are at the end of these wires that you can place wherever. You could place them on a hard drive, you could place them, like physically place it on your GPU, you know, maybe the back plate on your GPU, you know, whatever, and you can monitor the thermal situation with those 12 sensors. The board also provides on board five DC slash PWM controllable fans. You can use DC or PWM to control the fan speed, whichever one you wanna do. Um, so that gives you a total of nine independently controllable DC slash PWM fans, plus a 10th fan, which is your CPU fan. But you know, everybody's got the CPU fan, so that doesn't really count, does it? So at the back of the board, starting from the left, you've got four USB 2 ports. That other USB port that's turned sideways is actually an interface for a piece of software called Tough Detective. What this does is this USB port communicates with your phone or Android tablet, something running Android. You run an app called Tough Detective, and Tough Detective interfaces with the microcontroller or the firm management controller on the motherboard. And so from that, you can power off the system, power it on. We'll get to that in a minute. There's two USB 3.1 10 gigabit per second ports. Those are the lighter colored USB 3 ports. Four more USB 3 ports. Two gigabit LAN interfaces, one Intel, one Realtek. Then the audio connections provided by the Realtek ALC 1150 codec. That's a SPDIF optical plus analog in and out. You've also got the option of USB BIOS flashback, there's the button, uh, which will let you flash your BIOS even without a CPU. You've gotta have that if you know a new CPU comes out and you buy this motherboard and you get the newer CPU, 
uh, you know, normally you have to boot up your motherboard in order to flash the BIOS. And if you've gotten a new CPU that the motherboard doesn't support without the software update, you're kind of stuck. Historically, in the olden days, you'd have to borrow somebody's old CPU, boot up your motherboard, flash it, and then give them their old CPU back, which is just a pain. USB BIOS flashback sort of avoids that. You can put your BIOS on a USB stick, even without a processor installed in the motherboard, it can flash the BIOS, so it's pretty neat. The M.2 slot is hidden away in the thermal armor itself, enclosed here at the bottom of the board. I worry about this because M.2 drives, like the new Samsung M.2, produce an insane amount of heat. And I've seen some builds that require glue-on heat sinks on the Samsung to keep it cool just because there is no airflow around the M.2 slot because of the M.2 slot placement on the motherboard. If you use the M.2, are you meant to replace the cover so that it's a completely enclosed situation? I would probably recommend that you run without the cover if you're using M.2. Also, this is a PCIe M.2. That means that there's no SATA connectivity in this M.2 slot. But this M.2 does support the NVMe breakout card, which is a little card that you put in the M.2 slot that gives you a mini SAS connector. And that mini SAS connector will carry the PCIe by three signaling to an external NVMe SSD. Now, the situation is that Intel has got these crazy high speed uh, NVMe SSDs, but they're big and they're bulky and they just won't physically fit in the M.2 slot. I mean, really to get high capacities to fit in an M.2 slot, we're gonna need like 3D die stacking technology and that sort of thing to really get the memory densities up to be able to stick this in there. But it's a, it's a miniature PCIe by four connection. So if, if you don't wanna use a PCIe SSD because you've got graphics cards in the way, you can use the NVMe adapter in the M.2 slot to an external NVMe SSD. Now this has been in the server space for a while. Uh, it's technically a mini SAS connector, which is not exactly the ideal connector to carry PCI Express signaling. It's not mini SAS, it's just the mini SAS connector. And you can use that connector to carry the PCI Express lanes to a, a quasi normal looking, you know, two and a half inch SSD. The Intel ones right now are about 50% heat sink. So that should tell you something, but I digress. Let's build a system so we can take a look at the UEFI and the software. In terms of hardware features, first off, you have three PCIe by 16 physical. If you're going to run a three-way graphics config, you need a case that has an extra slot below the edge of the motherboard in order to be able to support that because the last by 16 lane is just the very last spot for an expansion slot on the motherboard. This has to be done this way to support graphics cards that take up to three expansion slots. For 2011-3 processors that support 40 PCI Express lanes, this means that you can run by 16 by 16 by eight, and this would be the required configuration for a three-way NVIDIA setup. For 28 lane processors, such as the 5820K, you can run by 16 by eight by four with an AMD graphics solution, or by 16 by eight with an NVIDIA or an AMD graphics solution. The first two by 16 PCIe slots are Gen 3, while the black one on the bottom says it's PCIe Gen 2. Um, if you have non-graphics peripherals, you can get up to by eight on all five PCI Express slots here with a 40 lane CPU. Now, something that I found really neat with this motherboard is a piece of software called Tough Detective. This is actually a mobile app that you get on your cell phone and you plug in to that special USB port at the back. So if we go ahead and plug it in here, I'm gonna plug this into the Asus Zenfone 2 because surely that won't lead to problems. <laughs> Foreshadowing. And we're gonna just deploy the software and run it and see what it does. And this was really fiddly. I had a lot of trouble with this. I don't know why. It actually would hard lock the Zenfone 2 fairly consistently. I uh, even went so far as to update the UEFI and I, it was still a little fiddly. But when I did get it to work, it was actually really awesome. I could get the postcode, the last boot status, I could clear CMOS, I could force a system shutdown, I could do a graceful system shutdown, I could read the information from the system about the memory that was installed, the current fan speeds, temperature, voltages, pretty much any information that's useful from a diagnostic standpoint, you could sit there and read it and actually get it on your phone. Even with the system powered off, you could power it on and that's, that's actually exactly what we did. So I think that this application, it has some bugs, but I think that once the bugs get worked out, this is gonna be really, really useful. So if at first you don't succeed with this application, try and try again. Once I did get it working, it was pretty stable. I just don't know why I had trouble initially. It was sort of weird and crashy. It did lock up my phone a couple of times, but then once I got it working, it was actually, it was actually all right. It would be nice to see more controls, like maybe one, one button overclock or like one button toggle between, you know, <laughs> like normal and super overclock but that'll probably come later on down the line. I hope that this functionality is a herald of things to come on future motherboards because being able to use your smartphone to do diagnostics actually is a pretty cool thing. 
This one's uh, Easy Tuning Wizard was a little different. When you click Easy Tuning Wizard, it asks you some options about your cooling situation and whether you want to optimize for power usage or performance. And I just sort of clicked and let it do its thing. And the end result was that my 5960X that was in there was running at about 3.9 gigahertz on turbo and about three gigahertz all the rest of the time. Found the overclock to be pretty stable, but I was able to push it to about 4.5 normally manually so that's that's a pretty good overclock in a 5960x it's not the greatest but it's not really that bad either and that was around i think 1.7 volts if memory serves i didn't really run prime 95 or anything like that to see how stable it was long term because that's sort of that's sort of what i'm used to with that chip that's sort of what i'd pushed it to but the system was very stable even with the overclock just running through benchmarks and running through our standard fare stuff i'd actually forgotten that i'd overclocked it and i was like wow this is actually really fast and i was like oh still overclocked well that would explain it i'm not sure if this is a new feature in the uefi or not but it does have this raid configuration option so that if you've got a bunch of discs you can just hit a button and it'll configure the the uh, on chipset raid that's a software raid so i tend to shy away from software raid myself but the feature is there if you use it. Just going through the UEFI, I'm always very impressed with ASUS's UEFI. It seems like their UEFI in terms of number of options, of fine grain controls, I mean the fan controls, you've got these 10 PWM slash DC fan controls and you can control it all. You've got the stuff that you can control from Thermal Radar too. In terms of the stuff that they put in their UEFI, it's crazy the amount of stuff in the UEFI. I mean, it's a 2011, three motherboard and so you know it's pretty modern but in terms of all of the features that they give you in the uefi it's really you know far and away tons of options there it's it's always really impressive to look at it because they they have every little thing in the uefi that you can play with and i really like it this is also really good for linux so you can set your fan profiles and things in the uefi and your temperature profiles and then you don't have to mess with it in linux which is really great and so it would not be tech syndicate if Linux wasn't horning in on the action some way. I decided to boot up Ubuntu 15.04 because I had the install stick from where I did the Ubuntu 15.04 on the Surface Pro 3 video, just because kernel 3.19 is fairly recent. So booted it up, everything worked. Audio worked, both network cards worked, the onboard peripherals worked, USB 3, uh, both the Asmedia uh, USB 3.1 and the uh, USB 3, just regular USB 3.0, both sets of ports worked. It was fine. I used a memory stick to test. Now, I'm not sure if I'm getting the USB 3.1 speeds on the Asmedia controller. I suspect that that will be fiddly because that's a new thing. Maybe it's okay. I don't know. I didn't test that part of it. But for using a normal USB memory stick, worked fine. So I think I can report Linux actually works pretty well on this motherboard. And I was doing a UEFI boot, so I didn't have any problem booting back and forth between the Windows installation on an SSD and the Linux installation on the M.2. So take that for what you will. Now, of course, if you're looking for even more control, the bundled software that comes with the Sabertooth also includes uh, the Thermal Radar 2. This is where you can get a readout of your nine different thermal sensors that are soldered on the motherboard and the, and the three that you can add in if you elect to plug those in and see what's going on. This also gives you much finer granularity control of those 10 DC slash PWM fan headers all around the motherboard. And so with this, you can actually set really aggressive fan profiles. Another feature that I'm not, I think is a new feature on this motherboard is that the fans can actually run for a while after the system turns off to help, you know, sort of get the heat out of the system after you turn it off. So it's not just sitting there baking. I think that's kind of a nice touch. You can actually set your own profiles, like your own behavior profiles. So depending on the thermal readings from all the different sensors around the system, you can control the fans individually. For a tower system where you've got, you know, up to 10 fans, being able to individually control all of the fans will help you minimize noise, but still have, uh, you know, really aggressive overclocking, really aggressive, you know, video card cooling, uh, depending on what you're doing, while also being able to minimize your noise because you can control each fan individually. So you can really sit there and dial it in, in terms of whatever behavior you want, as far as, uh, you know, having the right fan kick on to cool the right component. I think that's a nice touch. In terms of like motherboards that have fan controllers, I really haven't seen anything that has a fan control, temperature control situation as sophisticated as what I see in this motherboard. So given the build quality, sort of the crossover between workstation and enthusiast, this is sort of a nice touch. I'm also happy to report that installing Thermal Radar 2 and the entire suite of software that that it comes with AI charger and all that is a lot easier than it has been in years past. You know, in years past, it's really, the software has been a little bit fiddly uh, and a little bit crashy. And so I tried to poke at it a little bit to see how things had improved 
and I'm happy to report that things seem to have improved as far as the software being stable and not crashy and not weird. And it's always the edge cases where it would act a little bit weird or like AI charger wouldn't exactly work exactly right. It seems like those problems have been resolved uh, from just sort of <laughs> testing things that have been issues on, on previous motherboards. So it's really nice to see that a lot of uh, quality control and a lot of testing apparently went into this version of uh, AI Suite and Thermal Radar 2 software to sort of the whole suite of software that goes with that so that's really nice i think honestly the thing that i had the most trouble with was the uh tough detective and i think that you know some leeway can be given there because that's a new piece of software sort of new functionality what else is out there that lets you control the entire motherboard and basically do you know technician level diagnostics you know from your cell phone on a motherboard that's pretty neat i had a lot of fun with that so Overall, I didn't really run into anything bad with this motherboard. The most disconcerting thing is that if you've got an M.2 that produces a lot of heat, I don't think you're gonna to wanna to put the door on the M.2 slot. I don't have one of the Samsung drives handy, but we did a build with one about six months ago and it was really hot when we were doing the disc diagnostics. And so I would not feel comfortable putting one of those inside the M.2 carrier. I'll have to remember to ask if they've tested that scenario and sort of what the outcome was. I have some friends that uh, are system integrators and uh, they reported that they, they actually have a, a stick on heat sinks for some of the builds that they do with the Samsung, the uh, super hot running M.2 Samsung drives. And so if they're sticking heat sinks on those, I just, I don't know if I'd, if you're gonna get a hot running M.2, don't put a hot running M.2 inside the armor. I just don't think that's a good idea. And you can monitor the temperature with your finger, basically put your finger on the chips. And if it's, you know, so hot that you have to bring your finger away, that, that may be a problem. So may shorten the lifetime of your M.2. Other than that, this motherboard is really solid in terms of software, in terms of Linux support, in terms of drivers. It's actually really stable. It's really good. I liked it. So if you've got one of these or you are thinking about getting one of these, I want to see you in the forums over at techsyndicate.com. So I'll see you there. I'm signing out. This is Wendell.